This is Kick-Ass Kyle Storm, New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Famer. You like independent wrestling? You like women's wrestling? Hardcore? Shoot interviews? Check out Chop's videos. You'll love what you see. What's up guys, Teddy Goods here, and for all of you who are junkies of early 90s independent wrestling, especially from the New England area, I need to let you guys know about Chop's videos on YouTube. I am a subscriber and I watch his videos frequently, tons of NEWA stuff, Tony Rumble stuff, CWA, um, Primal Conflict, just all kinds of hidden gems, a few matches of myself early in my career, so check it out, uh, Chop's videos on YouTube. Have a good one, guys. Oh, the uh, I know I forgot about Don Vega. We're talking about Don Vega and then Anthony. So when I met Don Vega in the NEWA, he was a kid, 16, 17 year old kid, and he always came to the the training. He always came to the shows with his dad, Julio, and everybody called him Pops. He always came around. He was always like, always had a big smile on his face. He was always supporting uh, Vega because I think his his first name that he did was the Punisher. And then he came out with, you know, the Punisher, Don Vega. Um, Julio would... I guess so, Tony like, Rumble gave him that. He was the Punisher, and then Tony Rumble said, you can't be the Punisher, you need a name. And he gave him <laughs> Don Vega. Well, it worked. Uh, Tony Rumble, when I when I was speaking to him, he was telling Cause he, me... Because he looked like D'Lo Brown and uh, Savio Vega combined, so that's where he got it from. Makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Um, Tony was big on giving people chances. Um, and he sat down and explained. He goes, I was self-trained. I I never was trained, you know, professionally. And he says that somebody gave him a chance. And then he found Taz. He found Tommy Dreamer. Taz was, so, he goes, Taz was like this mean Tasmanian devil, but with boa, boa, uh feathers and pink stuff and he goes Tommy Dreamer I, had I a, have uh, all that on tape do you and he's like Tommy Dreamer was like a, a stripper clips are in that video a lot of them clips uh like and he, he says you know he he knew how to redesign people to you know get the best out of them and when, when Don Vega came in he was like a little brother and you know his dad was like pops and uh, you know, his dad passed a couple of years ago, but uh, Don Vega took me to a show. I think it was 2008, early 2009. It was me, Zach. Um, oh, God. Uh, me, Zach, Jay Buster, um, and, and, and Don Vega. We went to Pennsylvania for a show. And... He did all the driving, and um, was this for WXW? No, this is for oh god, PWF JP, maybe. No, J, this this is a horrible. Uh, oh god! Well, all right, don't worry about it then. No, this is um, this was a kid who booked two shows in one day, hired a whole bunch of talent, Meanie, Steve Carino, Carino's kid, um, a bunch of people, but didn't have a dollar to pay anybody. And he tried to um, get out of paying people. And um, Spencer and JP had a, um, make, he, they made him go to an ATM machine and get the money, or they were going to kidnap his dog. <laughs> and, and I say that jokingly because I say that laughingly because they would never do anything to our animal. But uh, the kid was so scared that he went to an ATM machine and got the money. But that day, oh, Eric, Eric Dillon was with us too. It was the first time me and Eric Dillon got to know each other and such a great kid. Um, but we went to the liquor store before the, the, the first show was like an afternoon show. And then they had a later show in the, in the night. Well, the entire day and night, I just sat in the car drinking. Me, JP, uh, whiskey, Jameson, uh, doing shots and drinking beers. And I was trashed. I was trash beyond belief don vega being now don vega when he first came in was like a little kid brother he's now like our oldest brother or even like a, a younger fa father figure 
he's like, he, he doesn't drink. He's like, we're going to get some food and da da da. So we're, we're heading down the highway and we stop up at McDonald's. And I'm, again, I'm trashed. I'm throwing up everywhere. We get out of the car, I'm throwing up at the gas station. So we go to McDonald's. And we go into the men's room at McDonald's and I go into this one of the stalls and I'm vomiting everywhere in the stall. And all of a sudden I hear, and I'm like, what's that, Vega? And he goes, no, that's not me. That's the janitor. <laughs> and I was like, what's his problem? He goes, he just cleaned the toilet and just vomiting it. He's all pissed off. <laughs> but um, so he, he, you know, he was able to talk to the janitor guy and everything. And he said, oh, we'll take you out. We got him out of here. And then as we we're going in the building, McDonald's, there was a homeless guy or some guy begging for money outside. So I'm getting, I'm standing in line for food now. And I'm like, oh, I want to get the homeless guy some food. So um, I got my bag of burgers, fries, and soda. And as we're going, leaving, I said, oh, sorry, you know, for you. And I give him the, the soda and the burger and fries. He goes, oh, thank you. As we're leaving, <laughs> Big is like, oh man, he just threw your food away. I'm like, what? Yeah, he just threw all the bags of food away and everything. I'm like, damn mother f. And I was gonna go back and beat the guy, <laughs> but he was just he was just ribbing me. <laughs> but Don, you know, you know, he, um, yeah, he, he took care of me that night. He made sure I was, you know, he made sure I got home okay. Cause I I dropped my car uh, off at Zach's house. But Vega made sure I, I got home and um, I got my car the next day and everything. But, um, you know, he, he, it's family. You know, when you talk about wrestling being a family, uh, people that we've grown up with and, you know, like right now you got uh, Teddy Goods, you know, like I said, I remember Teddy, Teddy being a fan um, and just all through the years seeing him work, train and having all these matches now working, you know, AEW. Um, Anthony Green, Anthony Green, 2008, contacted me. I think the kid was like 16 or 17 years old at the time. And he asked me if I would do a, a I had no idea what podcasts were. I had no idea about any of this. He said he wanted to do an interview with me on the phone for a podcast he was starting. No idea what that was, but I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. I appreciate it. And we did the interview and I was like, the way he set up everything, the, the questions he asked and how he presented himself, total professional. Uh, I was blown away by the whole the whole thing that he had. Totally unlike some, huh? <laughs> no. But it's just for a 16 year, old, 16 year old kid, you know? And every time I seen him, when I, when I finally met him, and, and every time I see him, he's always polite and, and humble. And, you know, this, to see him now go from like chaotic to WWE NXT as uh, August Gray, which you know, I'm glad he got that chance. I just didn't like the name, but you know, what do I know? But uh, now he's doing AEW, and um, you know, so proud of that kid. He's just—it's good to see these kids. Like I said, kids, but it's good to see these guys that you've seen from the beginnings to go to their training. And Kofi Kingston—he uh, wrestled a show at the Rhode Island School for the Deaf for Mike Antonucci, and I think he wrestled Kimikaze that night. And um, after the match, I said, brother, I said, that was a great match. I said, how long have you been working for? And that was only his maybe fourth match at that time. This was like maybe 2000, maybe 2006, somewhere around there. Um, I know it was after the match I had with Anna. So that was 2005. So this had to be like 2006, 2007. Uh, it was him and um, and he had just started. He was he, he started training at Chaotic. It was one I, know, of his first I remember seeing Teddy Goods back when he was with the score back in two thousand one. I have tape of him, and oh, he God. says now he's like, "Wow, I was just starting back then." Like he was like one hundred and forty pounds. Yeah. Um, the thing about the score is, all those guys are a great bunch of guys. Um, uh, a guy, um, uh, uh, pride. I'm trying uh, to get all them now for uh, 
because I'm doing an NEWA thing too, TV, and I'm trying to do like a five minute segment each week with somebody. It's like saying yep. something about back then, back when I was helping yeah. George and stuff, like just a five minute like shoot thing of oh back then we did a memory or a story or whatever so i'm trying exactly. to get different people to just do a, like a thing like this like but short things yes yeah. and you can get cut pieces um uh brian noons and dan freights uh, or freitas or whatever great freitas freitas um their matches against the logan brothers they they could do a match every single night of the week for months and it'd be a different match. I have all them early ones they did in NEWA that I was taping them. The first ones they did were yep. for George over there. Yes. When they when they were the freaks of nature, when they were the clowns. I was just gonna ask you if you remember, because the Logan brothers, um Jose was telling me, because I remember they I was I put them over one night, uh, put them over verbally, uh went to the NEWA and I was like Who's these jokers, guys? They're fucking amazing. And, Jose, and, and you know, Jose was there, you know. And then a couple of, well, a couple of years later, uh, I see the Logan, you know, and I was like, oh, these guys are great. You know, there was three of them. There was a third brother, too. Nick, Nick, Brian. And Matt. Matt, yeah. Matt, Nick, and Brian, yeah. And Nick is the one that looks like Randy Orton. When Randy Orton first came out, uh, it had... Nick's face reminded me of Randy Orton when he first came out. There was a third kid too. I don't think he. I don't know if he was a brother or their friend that played the psycho dude that wore the. He used to wear like a straight jacket to the ring. All four of them used to come together and started together. Oh, I don't think he stuck with it though. I think he left and the Logans kept going. I, I want to say, but I'm not sure because I left too. So, yeah, the um, George Carroll. Um, when they when uh, the dogs of war with Matt and Kyle started their rivalry with um with uh, uh Dave and uh Dave Cole and um um uh, DC Dillinger and uh Eddie Edwards. Oh uh no the Dave Cole and uh Jay Buster, the Canadians. They okay. did a uh, they did a match where they beat the hell out of the dogs of war. They beat him with belts, and they did a beat down on him. And George says, "Listen," he goes, "After that match, after the beat down, the dogs, Matt and Kyle, they're going to leave the building with their, you know, their bags and everything. You're going to approach them, say, dude, you know, what was that? What happened? You know, why are you guys leaving? You know, kind of like, you know, where's the old dogs of war? What is this? You know?" And George is like, and then at some point, you're going to slap Matt you know, and say, you know, wake up guys, you know, I don't, you know, because we, we had history, you know, Matt, Kyle, myself, we, we ha we've had wrestling history together. What year was this? Um, Approximately. 2006. Uh, was that the Quincy, um, uh, the Quincy building, Omri, the Quincy Omri. And so I said, okay, whatever. But George didn't tell me a lot in detail. So all of a sudden, George, out of nowhere, grabs me. I'm in the back and sitting by Adrian. And he goes, all right, we're, we're going to do this now. I'm like, what? He goes, we're doing this live right now. And he just gets a camera and puts it on. And I'm like, one of the things, like, I, I was talking, what, what, what Rich Paladino knew is I, I don't like doing promos. I, I don't feel like I'm comfortable doing promos. But if you put a camera on me, right on the spot and tell me to go, I'll do something. I'll say something, right? So George just put me right on the spot and said, go. And I go up to Matt and Kyle and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You know, I'm like, you know, and they're like, didn't you see what happened? They they made us, you know, he, they beat the crap out of us. I'm like, and you're just going to grab your bags and leave the building? I said, that's not the dogs of war that I remember. That's like the puppies of the squared circle. And I was like, you want to leave now? Fine. And mind you, as we're doing this, the fans, this is during intermission, the fans are coming out into the uh, into the uh, the entryway and standing around us. And I'm, like, I'm trying to do that, like, that uplifting speech. You're like, you know, you guys want to walk out here with your tails between your legs? Go. Go do it. That's not the dogs of war that I remember. The dogs of war would 
go back fighting. We'll fight another day, you know, and I'm doing this whole thing. And I was like, you want to leave? Fine. And I slapped Kyle first, which I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> then I look at Matt. I said, you want to? Because I want it. Goes, and I said, the way I said it was, um, that's not what the dogs of war would, that I remember would have done. The dogs of war would kept fighting. And I slapped Kyle. I said, I mean, the dogs of war, they'd never give up. And I slapped Matt. And Kyle said, had a line, and they just walked out of the building. I was like, you guys can leave, and you guys can do this, and I, but I'll never forget the dogs of war. I'll never forget the guys that beat me down. I'll never forget the guys that laid, laid, laid me out bleeding in the middle of the ring. I remember the dogs of war, dogs of war, and the entire place is chanting dogs of war as they're walking out of the building. And, and you know, they're chanting that as they're leaving, and then George just turns the camera back on me, my face, and I'm just sitting there shaking my head. And Sheldon Goldberg said that was like, uh, there was a scene in Animal House where John Belushi is giving this like speech and yeah. he said it was a reminder of that. And it was funny, but uh, George was, I was comfortable doing that and it came out flawless. Um, uh, George just gave me the, the bullet points. He's, he's like, you're going to approach them. You're going to say this. You're going to slap Matt. I slapped both of them. Um, and then the, we did a great thing. Um, the, um, the, the Canadians were getting so got involved in somebody's match. And the three of us, me, Matt, Kyle, came out of the curtains as the Canadians were coming back. But we were behind. Like, so their backs were towards us. They're looking at the ring, right? So they turn around and see us. And I clock uh, Brian Cairo, and Matt and Kyle end up beating up on Cole and um, Cole and uh, Jay Buster, and we're beating up on them. We're beating up on them, and as soon as they they're laying out, they're laid out, I hold up keys, right? And Matt Matt and Kyle just look at me, and I'm holding up these keys, right? And I'm like, follow me, boys. So they take David Cole, and they take. Jay Buster put them on their shoulders. They follow me out of the building. The entire crowd follows us out of the building. We put them in the back of our trunk. <laughs> right? Kyle gets in the, uh, the driver's seat. I call shotgun. Matt gets in the back and we go take off. And we just take off with them in the thing. And Brian Cairo is still laid out at, at, in the, the gymnasium. So we end up going around the corner and everything like that. And we came back. So the crowd thinks we just took off with you guys. You know, we just kidnapped them. And then they do a thing with Cairo later on where Cairo's on the phone. He goes, where's my Canadian superstars? And of course, it's, it's like a conversation like, you know, we got, we're holding them hostage and type of thing. But it just works so well. You know, we had a lot of fun with that one. But, um, but George, George just... The way he produced everything, the way he came up with the, um, he, he's so good, you know. George is great. That's one of my big regrets. I didn't get to do more with George. I loved bouncing stuff off of George. And I never fully opened up because I never felt like I was in. I was like an outsider. And like when I left, I was just starting to really open up and connect me and him. Because at first yeah. I was like sh kind of shy because I'm an outsider. But George yeah. was totally open to me, and but I never felt like me and him were open, but I never felt like I could walk up to a wrestler and say, hey, do this. Hey, do that. Hey, because they'd look at me like, who the fuck are you? You know what I mean? If, if somebody asks you, open up. Right. You know? it was, but it would just start to get to that point towards the end where, I, especially promos and angles, because yeah. I, but George never addressed everybody to this is chop he's doing this it was just more or less he'd be out there and i'd walk into the locker room and go hey come here do this do this i need you to come outside and lift the log and put it on your shoulder and you're gonna be curling the log well and they're looking at me like why am i doing that because nobody yeah. else was doing that with people back then you know what i mean and some people got it and was like dude that's a great idea and other people were like why? No, nah, dude, I'm gonna I'm going outside to you know get a burger or whatever. You know, it was weird. it was kind of a weird time because nobody was doing that. Some people thought it was genius and great, and other people thought it was why are we doing that? 
you know, and look what he is now. He's not, you know, he's doing work for uh, NXT. So he's got a good mind, you know. It's kind of back to that again with nobody's doing that stuff. I think it needs that kind of stuff again. You need vigilantes and promos and weird stuff. Look at AEW don't do it and they need it. They should be doing yeah. They do it here and there. And when they do it, it's good stuff. Yes. Um, I miss the... Now everything seems like, okay, so if somebody comes into the WWE or uh, NXT, it's like, hey, they show up and th there used to be a buildup. Like, right. Uh, no, I hear you. Have, you know what I'm have some buildup, them coming in. Who is this guy? Tell me who he is. Get me connected to his character. Have him come in, beat a couple people. You know, yeah. it, there's none of that. Like, they, they just bring him in. They put the straps on a team real quick. Um, like, because I remember, like, the big boss man, for example, or Razor Ramon, perfect example. For weeks, it was like Razor Ramon coming out of a car on the street somewhere. Oh, machismo, yo, you know. And I don't think Razor appeared on TV for months. And, you know, they did these, the, the vigilante, uh, vig, vig, what is that word? Vigilante is, um, uh, like a superhero. I know. I say it wrong all the time. I just said it wrong. V Vigilantes? I don't know. But um, but I know what you're talking about. It's like these little short clips introducing the person get so the fans get know who they are. Because now today, you know, I love going to wrestling shows. I haven't been to a wrestling show in a while, but uh, before 2019, I had my stroke in 2019, and I haven't been to a wrestling show since. Um but before that, I was going to XWA shows on Thursday nights. And I love going to these independent shows, seeing new people like MGF, you know, on a Thursday night, you know, MGF would show up with some of the, the New Jersey guys and stuff and really don't know who these guys are. You know, there's no, they just bring these guys in. Uh, MJF is good. Um, there was a couple other guys they brought in that were really good. JT Dunn's good. Um, uh, David Starr, uh, I, I know he kind of disappeared, but um, yeah, these guys bad happened with him with the cancel culture. Yeah, that's um, uh, Joey Ryan's still around somehow, but <laughs> yeah, you um, don't hear much about him though. He's fighting to stay stay alive, keeping his nose above the water. He well. There was a show. I think David Starr's was worse. I think it, I'm not sure. I can't remember, but I think his was something else. Yeah. Um, was his underage or something, maybe? I'm not sure. Well, it was the way he treated women. Um, I know um, Bad Boy Riley, uh, that kid was money. And he went and screwed it up with... Um, videos of kids and stuff like that he screwed himself um but the um um i can't remember what i was talking about i'm sorry um oh going to with joey ryan and all that and uh joey, david star so joey ryan he still runs shows and yeah, but I think that's the only way he's working is because he's doing his own shows, and I don't think he's doing he well with them. He won't even put his name on the show, so all these wrestlers are getting booked, thinking they're wrestling for some company, and they go in, they find out it's owned by Joey Ryan, and then now they're like, you know, they'll work that one show, and then they don't work again. But um, uh, but th there's there's nothing that okay. When I go to wrestling shows now, and this is no offense to anybody, no offense to, to, to JT Dunn or anybody in wrestling, but when I go to a wrestling show and I see a guy in the ring now, I'm like, is this a fan? Is this the guy that bags the groceries at Stop and Shop? There's no one that looks like... When, when you went to a wrestling show, you saw guys that you would not see on the streets every day. You know, either they were freaks they were the tall, they were you know like giants. They're just normal looking people. Everybody's got their head shaved. Well, if, if they were, it was a tough, the tough guy on the block. Like if it was somebody yeah. you'd see, it was a tough guy at the bar that you didn't want to mess with. Yeah. Now today it's just 
everybody just looks the same. They're not a character. They're not a gimmick. They're trying to be themselves. You know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's just hard to watch today. You know, it's just, um, I enjoyed the NXT, the black and gold NXT. I'm not a fan of the uh, the bright lights, colors, and but even even that was good, but it wasn't great. It wasn't as good as like what we grew up on and what we watched. You know what I mean? It was better than what else was out there, but there yeah. were still holes in it. We, the, um, the when they talk about um, sports entertainment and pro wrestling, there really is a difference. Um, if I was a kid, if I was 10 years old now, pro wrestling would not interest me. They, they would, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it was the stuff that I grew up with in the late seventies and the eighties that was always entertaining. You know, the, the free, when you watch the free birds, um, uh, jump the Von Erics and you saw Fritz get one of their boots and they're nailing them in the head. You had uh, Chris Adams and Hernandez, uh, Gino Hernandez and Chris Adams uh, destroy the uh, Cadillac. It was Texas Stadium. They took the chains. They buzzed. Yeah. You thought they won the Cadillac. It, there, there, was, there was nothing in my mind that thought. That was one man that, gang's chain. Was it? Oh, just, it, you know, there was nothing that made it sound look phony, that look hokey. And unfortunately, I, I, I watch a lot of Jim Cornette. Or I listen to a lot of Jim Cornette podcast where he talks about his problem with today's wrestling. And I'm like, I feel the exact way. You know, there's nothing. Uh, just. No, I agree. Going back to what you say earlier, I remember when I used to watch world class and I'd flip over to WWF. And when I got that age and people would say it was fake, I remember thinking they're talking about that Hulk Hogan stuff. Because this yeah. world class is real, and that WWF stuff's fake. And I really thought that at the yeah. age of, like, 10, 11 years old. I thought that was fake, and this is real, because they're hitting each other. Look at that. They're hitting each other with that boot and stuff. And and then when you get the AWA and NWA, that's like, wow, this is even more real. Because they didn't really have gimmicks. You had Larry Zabisco, um, you had guys. Not even bringing the gimmicks into play, just them them hitting each other. Like the Freebirds yeah. and Von Erics were. I mean, they would. Hey, watch my nose and my eyes and my throat, and my balls. But they were hitting <laughs> each other, man, in the head and in the cheeks and in the stomach. You know, they were wailing each other. Michael Hayes said the the worst thing was you never know when you got in there and the Von Erics came in and they were fired up and foam fist. You never know which is going to hit, what's not going to connect, because they were just wild. You know, Kevin, they say was the worst, and they said every night you felt like you were in a fight. It's just <laughs> they, that's what they did. They didn't feel they tried not yeah. to hit you in the nose and stuff. You know, don't yeah. hit in the nose, the eye, or the balls, or whatever. But everything else was pretty much open game. You know, you watch them, watch them today. Put a tape in, and you look at oh, it. I, you watch I do. them hit each other with the boot and stuff. Like try not to hit me with the the heel of it, but you, you hit me with the boot. Jose will probably tell you some stories where. Um, I've gotten a little um, excited in rings and I would, you know, throw some fists, catch them on the chin once in a while. <laughs> because when you're in there with a friend, um, it's not like you you go easy and you're not afraid, uh, you want to hit them hard or anything like that. It's, it's more forgiven, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, and you go back to what you said earlier. Who, who, every person you talk to from our age group goes, "How do you introduce to wrestling?" Well, I was over at my grandmother's. Uh, my grandmother used to show me. It, it, it isn't kids; it's yeah. grown adults or grandparents or all the people that introduced them to it. My grandmother was the biggest fan and used to go crazy. Nine times out of ten, that's a story you hear. Yeah, the um, I I used to know women that my mom worked with at a restaurant. And they would scream at their TVs. Scream, you son of a B word, you son of a B. And I'm like, they can't hear you. I don't care. They piss me off, you know. And like you also said, I, I, I hate the excuse. Well, now that kayfabe's dead, 
People knew it was fake back in the th- 1930s. It ain't there, that. It's that they do it believably enough that you can watch it. We know that f- movies are fake. We know that books are fake. We know the TV's fake. They, so they don't give up and go, why bother trying to make it look real? They still try to make it look real on a TV show. Why? You know it's fake. You know what I mean? I hate that nowadays people just give up and go, we don't got to try to make it look real no more. We know it's fake now. That is such a lame-ass excuse. I hate it. And it's not fake, like you said. That's where they come with the big leg slap. <laughs> As Mike Baker would say, leg slap. <laughs> yeah, just all of it. And anytime you say anything, the, a fan or anybody just says, well, since Vince broke kayfabe, there's no more kayfabe, so it don't matter. There's no more kayfabe. Well, and, and the thing is, is all these people don't even know what these words mean. And, and kayfabe just means quiet, secret. Yeah, it's a fan says, "Shut your mouth, stop talking about it." Yeah. When um, you, when you go to the TV tapings, there's a room that's called the kayfabe room, and that's where the producers or Vince will take the what the boys that are involved in a particular uh, match or spot, and they'll talk about what this, what's going to happen for the night. And it's called it means a K- secret, like like keep it secret. Exactly. And if, if if you know me and somebody at a restaurant, we're talking, and somebody walks by us, or, you know, comes, you know, we're talking about something, and then uh, oh, kayfabe. Or if you want to say it properly, kazabe for zabe. The whole Connie kazabe for kazabe. Fazabe, um, Mizak. Uh, I hate I hate the Connie words, but <coughs> but um, I got into an argument with a kid in Denny's one night. First of all, he was talking about the mass transit incident, and he was making statements of facts. And I said, I I just turned around. I was like, Are you even old enough to know about that? I said, well, You were even born then. And he goes, No, but I just heard from my brother. I says, Listen, I says, Don't. That what what, you, what you're saying is absolutely not true, and the kid yelled at me, and he he because had no idea who I was. He's like, he goes, oh, don't talk to me like I'm a, I'm a fucking excuse my language. He goes, don't talk to me like I'm a freaking mock. I said, like, you know what a mock is? He goes, yeah, it's a a dumb fan. I says, oh, good lord, a mock is a term that came from the carnival people in the in the times of Connie. When a ticket seller at a carnival would be selling the tickets, a lot of times, you know, the, uh, the, the dad would bring the family and they would see, you know, dad would open up his wallet, pick up the money. The, dad, the, the, the ticket seller would see that the dad had a lot of money. So what the ticket seller would do was put a little chalk in their fingers, right? And they would keep it in their fingers. And when they saw somebody with a lot of money, they would be like, sir, welcome to the carnival. Have a great time. They pat him on the back. And with the chalk in the hand, they leave a little mark on their on the back of their shirt or jacket. That would tell the people running the game boots and all the other boots, hey, this guy's got money. So they would try to wheel them in to play the games and get the money. That's all it is. It's just, uh, we're all mocks. You know, I, I'm a mock. Yeah, I'm Mark's supposed to be just a fan. Anybody that's a fan and anybody that's talking about her there is a Mark, really. You know, it, it, there's no such thing as a smart Mark. That's an oxymoron. And I go, I went, I go, I, I pay $50 to go see Ghost. I'm a Mark. I bought a ticket. When you go there, what do you do? You walk over to the merch table. I'm a Mark. You know, I'm there. I'm their target audience. You know, I'm there at the concert. Sell me a shirt, you know. that's, And that's all it is. It's... It, and all these people today it might like, be oh, a demark, a dumb mock, demark. <laughs> uh, yeah, pro- there's a lot of demarks, <laughs> but it's just like, and, and I, I, in the early 2000s, I used to go on the message boards, especially the Burning Hammer, and I get really mad, like when people would try to be smart and they try to like use these words. I'm like, I, and it would get me mad, and I'd be typing away, typing away, and I just learned, you know, to stop. <laughs> But it, we, you you gotta about, laugh at it. Most of it's funny, I think. When you see people like saying stuff, it's just funny. It's like people are so ignorant and stupid, and they they think they're like so smart, and it's just like I just shake my head and laugh. Like, and my my thing is, what is I heard? 
I heard tonight at the Rumble, somebody's going to make an appearance. I heard, I heard. Well, who'd you hear from? Well, the funny thing is 99% of it's opinion. And they talk yeah. about like, it's 99% opinion. And well, the other percent is Dave Meltzer said, you know, or Dave Meltzer gave it stars. So that makes it fact. Shut, shut up. Okay. Question. Who is the best worker ever in wrestling? The best worker, bar none. Probably McMahon. You, just, you said his name. Meltzer? Meltzer. Dave Meltzer got billions of people to buy his newsletter. And he got people to believe that there's a star rating system for wrestling matches. Well, Coronet started it, but yeah, he made it popular, popularized yeah. it. Cornet actually started it? I didn't know that. Yeah, Cornet started it, and there's only supposed to be four stars, not five. Meltzer made five, and now he's put six <laughs> and seven. Yeah, you oh, never like, heard that? Look it up on the oh. Cornet things. He talks about it. Cornet started it back in the 70s. Oh, Jesus. Meltzer but, took it from Cornet. That's why Cornet gives him so much shit about it. Every time he fucks up, he's like, Dave, don't even know how to do it. I started the damn thing. He took it from the TV guides used to do it. That's where uh, Cornet got really, from. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, but it just think like Dave Meltzer got people buying his newsletters to believe that there's actually this system of a great match, a five star match, a top five matches of all well, time. Well, people th take it as fact. Like that means it's a fact. Whatever he puts it on. Well, look at Facebook today, and people say. Oh, this critic reviewer said this movie, a Spider-Man movie, whatever, is, is horrible. Well, I love Ghost. I love the band Ghost. There are people that don't like the band. Does that mean that they suck? No. You know, uh, NASCAR. Uh, my ex-girlfriend, she was a huge NASCAR fan. I'm like, it's. I don't like NASCAR. I think it's stupid. Does it suck? No. It's just not something that I like. I went to a NASCAR race after we broke up. I actually took her to a NASCAR race because I told her, you know, I would always take her to a NASCAR race. And I actually walked out as a fan. I loved it. it just the experience of being around everybody. You know, the, the portion of the cars going around the circle is kind of annoying, but I think it's just being around all those people and it becomes fun. But I had a good time when I went. Did you watch the Brock Lesnar interview on... Um, Oh my God, Pat McAfee's. No. Uh, oh my God. You got to watch it. It, it it's it, it's if you can tonight, go to YouTube and it was from like Valentine's Day, whatever it was. Brock is hilarious, and he explains that he didn't have a TV growing up on a farm, and the first time he ever heard of professional wrestling is he was in college, and they would watch it in the dorms, and uh, Brock talks about he now has um, his own Brock season. And he worked with the guys called the Bearded Butchers, which have their own YouTube videos. And Brock wants to learn how to butcher meat and stuff like that. So he went, met with the Butchers. And there's a video of him learning how to cut meat and, you know, skin, you know, the animals and stuff like that. And um, if you go to the, um, the Bearded uh, Butchers website and use the Brock, uh, the, co the com uh, promo code Brock, you get 10% off the uh, Brock Lesnar seasoning here. <laughs> what are you getting a cut on this? <laughs> no, I'm not the, sponsored uh, yet. I gotta get some sponsors here. No, I, um, uh, the baited butchers, I went to their website after the Brock uh, interview I saw, and um, yeah, it, it's, re it's real. It's the Brock Lesnar seasoning, and um, I just got it in the mail today. Yeah, that's why I got you right oh, now. Oh, you haven't tried it yet? No, it smells amazing. It really does smell really good, but um, but but yeah, but Brock. I mean, Brock Lesnar. Um, that interview is really really cool because it just explains like, it shows the real side of Brock Lesnar. Like you know, what I mean, like it's like, um, in two thousand, in the early two thousands, when he left WWF, people were like saying, "Oh, he left because he he hates wrestling. He hates this." And that's just people talking, you know, that's, but 
that's why it pisses me off when people say state as fact, you know. Um, well, I think he oh. said something when he left, didn't he? There was something he said about fake wrestling or something, if I remember right. I can't remember the uh, exact statement, but he said something one time because I was pissed at him for a while. When he did the UFC thing, he said something like, this is much better than that fake wrestling crap or something. I can't remember what it was exactly. He did a match, and he went on. He, he, he crapped on professional wrestling, and he says, I don't even drink Coors Light. I drink Bud Light or something. And he just, like, he went off on the sponsors. and um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what buried him. Not... Yeah. What I lost you. I think that's what hurt him there when uh he yeah. crapped on wrestling being fake and he's he's the real thing. He don't want to hang with that fake stuff or something. I forget exactly how he worded it. No, I no, I totally remember. And then Ronda Rousey pissed me off when she yeah, made a she comment. Did it too. You know, she said, you know, it's professional wrestling is like fake fighting with my friends and I was like don't you know that just I don't know but and now she's back yeah uh I don't know how long but I don't long, know long to get some millions well Brock they asked Brock Lesnar like how long do you see yourself you know, continue wrestling goes as long as they pay me. <laughs> oh, but he, he explained it that professional wrestling is a money business. You know, it's you know, if somebody goes into wrestling and says, Oh, I want to be a heavyweight champion, uh, I want to do this, and I want to, you know, no, you want to be a professional wrestler. It's it's why anybody works. You know what I'm saying? Like, why why does this person play football? Why is this person you know, it's not because you know I want to you know, uh, hit other guys and carry a football to go just to make money, you know. Sometimes it depends. Some, I mean, you start out playing baseball as a kid because you love baseball, and sometimes you keep doing it and you just want to say, hey, if I could make a living at doing what I love, I love it. You know what I mean? Like, you didn't wrestle to make money. You wrestled because you loved wrestling, right? Um, I wrestled because I, I loved it uh, growing up as a kid. And I wanted to give back what those I watched gave me. And I made a couple of bucks here and there. Um, I was even paid with stale pastries at some point. And I had to get that in there because that caused a bunch of chaos. Um, I heard that story. And I told the story. Uh, there's a, a website called the New England Independent. Uh, New England and. Um, Insider, I think it was. Yeah, it was a like, New England Independent, too. It might have been that, because we were the New England Independents, and then they opened up the New England okay. Independent. And it was um, somebody sent me some questions, and they said, what was your worst payday? And I responded with being paid with stale pastries. So I went into detail about that. And the, the story was actually supposed to make me look bad. I wasn't trying to talk bad about the company. And it was um, it was a Sunday afternoon. Me and Jose uh, did a show for Yankee Pro Wrestling in New Bedford. And Joe, Joe Eugenio, he had a um, um, like an auction uh, place that he ran wrestling shows on Sunday afternoons. So as me and Jose were leaving... Joe Eugenio comes over to me and Jose. He goes, hey, guys, I, um, I, I got some you know, pastries for you to take home. So he gives us each like four, three boxes of these pastries. Edamons, uh, coffee cakes, something like that. So we leave. Claudia's driving. And we're on our way to Bad Boy Billy Black. Uh, if, you remember, if you remember Bad Boy Billy Black. Yeah. Uh, we, we were on, his way, on our way to his house for an ECW pay-per-view. So as we're on the way to the, his house, Claudia says, oh, we got to stop somewhere and get something, you know, something to bring to the house, you know? 
And I said, well, we got these pastries that we can bring <laughs> that we got from Joe Eugenio. And she's like, oh, okay, you know. But we stop, we got some sodas and stuff like that. And we, we, we get to, you know, Billy's house and we walk in and uh, we got bags of soda and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, we, we, we even brought some pastries. And Rob's like, you know, hey, you know, cool, thanks, I appreciate it. And he goes, hey, wait a minute. I was like, why? He goes, you got these from Joe Eugenio's auction. I was like, no, we didn't. He goes, yes, you did. I'm like, how do you know? This six months past the expiration date. <laughs> so it's like, I got busted, you know, bringing stale pastries. <laughs> so I told that story to kind of like, it was to make fun of myself. And um, uh, I know Steve Akkad and some of the guys, they got offended by it. Because every time I would see them, they uh, we 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 really didn't speak too much to each other, but then after time, you know, you know that it was all buried under the bridge. And but yeah, that's just, that's one of the funny things I one of the stories I had was I was paid with stale Edmonds pastries. Would it have been all right if they weren't stale? I was so happy with them. <laughs> I, I still ate them. <laughs> He's going to put them in the microwave for like 30 seconds. Yeah. And, uh, the, and the funny thing about that is when I told that story on the uh, New England Depen uh, that website, um, Mayhem, uh, I'm sorry, PWF uh, brought me I back. It was Informer, New England Informer, I think it was. New England Informer. Uh, Matt and Kyle brought me back into PWF as the uh, Mayhem Heavyweight Champion. And I wrestled a uh, nice guy, Matt Peterson. And after the match, I go downstairs and I'm, you know, just, you know, relaxing. And Claudia comes to me and said, oh, Jack Diamond. Uh, Jack Diamond was, um, uh, is a wrestling fan. If you don't know who Jack Diamond is, he's a really, really nice guy. Um, he travels all over the place for these wrestling shows. And he, used to, he lives up in the Vermont and he comes down Rhode Island, Massachusetts for these shows. And he actually brought a, uh, he went across the street to the convenience store and he bought me a box of fresh donuts after my match. And Chloe hands me a bag and she goes, oh, Jack Diamond said to give this to you. And I look and it's, it's a fresh, it's a fresh box of Edmonds donuts. And uh, I thought that was really cool. You know, it's just somebody took something, you know, that happened to me. And so that, that, that was, that was something that was really cool that I remember. And, be um, funny if you start going to all your matches and everybody starts bringing you like donuts and pastries that, and stuff and that's part of your gimmick. I you like the pastry would, man. Yeah, that's the last thing I need right now. Um right with your diabetes and stuff, that'd be the last thing, right? Yeah. Uh got diagnosed with the diabetes in 2016. And um, so I, I immediately I cut out alcohol, any kind of drinking. And um, when I had my last stroke, um, Steve Langer actually um, spoke to me at the last Joe Bruins Hall of Fame uh, ceremony um, about fasting, the intermittent fasting. And he, he turned me on to uh, Dr. Jason Fung, who's an endocrinologist in Canada. And he talks about fasting for 24 hours, 36 hours, and um, I started watching their videos and, and this past, uh, I would say December, I went back up over 400s and um, my weight and um, my heaviest was 455. And when I had the stroke and everything, I was 410, 400 and it came down a little bit, but I started implementing the, um, the fasting. There are some days I would fast for like 24 hours, then I'll have a meal. Uh, some days I would fast for 12 hours and have a meal. And I noticed that my, my A1C was dropping, my, my blood sugars were dropping, my weight was dropping. So this past uh, December, my weight ended up back going back up. And um, right now, today, I think I ended up weighing myself, I was like 341, 342. So staying away from donuts, 
and intermittent fasting is doing pretty good for myself. You know, it's just, and it's hot. It's, you know, I love pizza. I love Chinese food, pasta. And the thing is you can still have it, but because, you know, you're, you're, you're fasting, intermittent fasting, you have that one meal uh, and you don't over, you know, overeat, you know, if you, if you're going to have pizza, have a few slices, don't have the whole pie, you know, but. Yeah, that's the hard part, right? Especially after you fasted. Yeah, but um, yeah, we we we've lost too many good people. It, 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 with Dave Jackson, he you know he developed diabetes and it put him in the chair, and um, it just seen a lot of my friends going through all that. Just you know, I, I you gotta take care of yourself, you know. Yeah, that's why I want to get all this stuff out here, all these stories and all this stuff. Yeah. All the footage and stories has to be out there, man, because if it ain't now, when's it going to be out there? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Look look at this next generation. They don't care, dude. They're all playing video games, and there ain't no backstage stories. There ain't nobody going to tell this stuff. That's why I yeah. want it out there. I mean, even if it ain't on a big level, this small level stuff, you guys are the family and the stuff. You know, there is a lot to tell. Yeah. So, how many people are putting it out there? Not that many. There's a few, but yeah, that's why I'm trying to get it all out there. Yeah, just I I, I wish my memory is a lot better. Um, well, it takes springing stuff up and showing you stuff, looking at footage. There's a lot of stuff I want to do. I want to do like watch alongs, like put matches on and sit here and watch them with you, and you yep. can talk about it as we watch it, stuff like that with pe different people. Uh, just stuff, different ideas I got like that that I want to do with people that would help. You know, if, if I put a match on right now and you're watching, I bet you things would pop. Oh, yeah, I remember the night, the yeah. week before we did this. Or the, you know, stuff would pop in your head. Well, you, uh, you posted the video of the, the, Puerto Rican, uh, per, uh, the Puerto Rican festival where I wrestled cue ball. And that was right after the match. Um, that was right after, that was a couple of months after I um, got my tooth knocked out. And... Um, I remember the match, like I remember wrestling him, but in the match, I do the, um, I, I, when I used to call my spots, I would give them names. And like, Rick, if, I, if I had somebody down on the ground, I would say Ric Flair, that means I was going to go to the top rope and I wanted him to toss me off. Uh, when I called uh, 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 Mr. Perfect, that would, I would snap me on him. I would do the running jump snack, neck snap and then I would follow that up with a kick to the face or something like that. And I did that, the cue ball in the match. And I'm like, I don't remember doing that. But, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's, I thought that was a pretty good match because I was like, you know, it, it, that was, you know, 11 years ago. And I sit there and I said, well, 11 years ago, I was flipping around and running and doing well, all this. 21 years ago. I'm, I'm, I, you're right. I'm so sorry. 21 years ago. And, um, and now today I, I can't get out of bed. <laughs> it takes me 20 minutes to get out of bed and straighten my back out. And right. There was that and what the rain show right before it. No remorse. The one in the rain outside. The rain outside. No remorse. Isn't that the other one you wrestled cue ball on? Um with balls Mahoney and and uh Nemesis. Okay, I, I, okay, yes. Oh, my God. See? I totally forgot about that one. I think I posted that one, too. Did I post that one, too? Maybe That's I didn't. He, Maybe um, I just watched it so, and didn't post it. Um, The guys from CZW were there. Yeah, Nick uh, Burke was there. Ruckus was there. That was the first time they came down. Yes. Okay. So, Ruckus, I had seen videos of him running up the walls and doing all this crazy stuff. So when I got there uh, and I met him, I, I said, you know, I'm a big fan of your work and everything. And he's really, really nice, keep very humble. And in our match um, with cue ball, the finish was um, Brian Cairo coming out on, on my behalf. And he goes to throw the, 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 the pool cue, uh, cue ball's uh, pool cue into the ring. And I thought, you know, it, it was supposed to be like, I'm ready to catch it up in the air. And he slides it into the ring, goes between my legs. Cue ball gets his thick. I turn around and he clocks me over the head. And 
I told uh, Cuba, I said, dude, I says, when you hit me, hit me. You know, don't don't hold back. You know, I'll, so I'll take a big bump for you and everything. I says, but just don't hold back. He goes, all right. So I remember him taking that stick and I tuck my chin, I take it on the top of the head. I fall back and he covers me. He goes, oh, excuse my language. He goes, oh, fuck, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And, you know, he, he gets, he's announced the winner and everything. I roll out of the ring. I'm, I'm selling. Now, as soon as I go put the, my head, my hand on top of my head, I'm like, what the hell? So I, 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 I walk into the back and the first person I see is Ruckus. And Ruckus goes, oh man, you okay? I'm like, why does everybody keep asking me this? And Ruckus is like, dude, look at your head. And I had this big egg on my head from, from getting hit with a pool stick. And the thing is, cue ball's pool stick exploded, cracked in half, just totally broke. And Ruckus said, brother, he goes, did you guys like gimmick the stick? I'm like, no. I told him just to hit me as high as he could, you know, to make it look good. And but um, th th that kid is such. I don't even know what he does anymore. If he's still working, uh, but yeah, he was an amazing, talented kid. Who's that? Nick Ruckus. Br Ruckus, yeah, yeah. I think and, he still works some, um, you know, up there. I, I don't think it's. I don't know if it's full time, but he works here and there. I see some posters. And Nick I don't Br know about Q ball. I've been able to get a hold of Q ball. I haven't spoken to him since 2005, maybe 2006. No, nobody I've spoken to knows anything about cue ball at all. The only thing I've been able to find out is his name is Sam. That's the only thing. Yeah. No, no social yeah. media, no last name, no nothing. Um, no phone number. Nobody knows anything about him. Have you talked to Jose? Ariel? I did talk to him. I don't remember if I asked him about cue ball or not. I might have asked. He said he hasn't talked to him. I don't know if I asked. Like, but nobody said they had him on Facebook or anything like that. Oh, um, yeah. He's um, he, he was a good kid. Uh, I enjoyed working with him. Um, yeah. Wow, you you just bringing that that match up, just kind of like, wow. But even Nick Burke, um, I remember Nick Burke is a good worker. Um, there was another kid on that card too. Um. Something yeah, the high hurricane kid. Who was the other? There was another kid. The hurricane was, kid. I don't know who that is. He fought Ruckus, the hurricane kid, little skinny kid. He fought Ruckus on the oh. card. He was from CZW. Zeba. Oh yeah, Zeba fought in Network, went against Jose and Vert, and then yeah. the hurricane kid fought uh, Ruckus. All four of them were from CZW, I guess. Exactly, Zeba. That was a kid. I thought we already mentioned Zeba. <laughs> oh, I, I my my I, I can't remember. He's passed away too, you know. Zeba has passed away. No. Oh man. Yeah, like last year, I think. Oh Jesus, I didn't know that. Wow. Uh, I, I, last year, Nick Steele, that still. The uh, Nick Steele pass and that kind of it's still that yeah. seems really unreal. Yeah, I was, I've been trying to figure out the dates of Nick Steele, like his birth and the date he passed, because I was I thinking think about he, doing a tribute for him. February. Um, I mean, the the guys to ask is definitely like Ryan Drew, um, Teddy Goods. Um, those are the guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to ask some of them Yankee Pro guys would probably know. Yes, absolutely. Um, those guys would definitely know. I'm I just remember, trying to get it like a set list with set dates and get like some videos so I can post every year and make them just because then they'll be on the internet. And anytime if anybody does want to search them, they'll come up in five years and 10 years, whatever. They'll be out there. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember him and his dad um, ran uh, Coastal Pro. And those are the first, actually, first few uh, independent shows they used to go to. And that's where I saw like Steve Bradley, Bob, uh, Bob Evans, uh, PJ Walker, who is just incredible. Um, I, I used to see those guys and maybe 25, 30, 50 people in a, in a small little, you know, VFW hall type place. Those, are, those, those matches were a lot of fun. 
But um, Nick Burke, I remember a couple of years back, Nick Burke had a, a, a gimmick. Uh, he was like a, a lounge singer, almost like a karaoke type of singer, like a lounge singer. And I thought that would, that would went over really good. Yeah, probably would have. You know, th- people don't think of gimmicks are what to get over. They just go, oh, I'm going to go out and wrestle and be tough. Or, oh, I'm going to go out and be funny. Oh, I'm going to go yep. out and be goofy. You know, that's it. Yeah. Like nowadays, uh, people think heel. People don't know how to be a heel. You know what being a heel is now? Be obnoxious as I can. Wear the most obnoxious shirt. I mean, be obnoxious and offend people, and I'm a heel. No, that ain't yeah. being a heel. Yeah, exactly. Make me want to kick your ass. Make me want to go to that arena to see you get your ass kicked. That's being a heel. I don't give a fuck who you're wrestling. I want to see somebody kick your ass. That's me in a heel. I want to go to the schoolyard and see the bully beat you up. And that's why MJF is on top right now. You know, be, nobody wants to be anybody. Like Chris Jericho trying to be a heel doesn't work anymore. And imagine imagine MJF with like good booking, with like with Bill Watts booking him or, or oh Gary Hart booking him or something. You know yeah. what I mean? Could you just imagine? Tony Khan has just got him floating there and throwing him. Like, imagine him not doing that singing dance routine and that type of stuff, but but just, like, doing what he should be doing would yeah. be amazing, I think. He should have been on top of the world two years ago. You know what I mean? So many of them guys. Wardlow should have been a superstar two years ago, you know? So many of these guys, like, people are like, oh, this he's starting to push him. What do you mean? They should have been superstars two years ago. They should have been, like, on top of the world. Hangman Page should have been champ two years ago. Fuck all that Omega shit. But who who do you have in these companies? You have 200 plus people in WWE. You got AEW who's got everybody else. This is too many people in these companies. I know, but whose fault's that? I know. You know what I mean? It's been booked so bad. It drives me crazy. It makes me rip my head. There's so much potential. There's so much good stuff. And they keep doing good things. And you see something good and you're like, there it is. And then they execute it. And it's like, why'd you do that? Or why'd you rush it? Why'd you do it so fast? Why'd you slow it down? Stop. Oh, my God. Don't do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Drives me crazy. It's like you have it right there at the tip of your, right in your hand. Look at, oh, Vince threw you 10 more good guys. Look what they do with Jay Lethal. Oh, my God. It makes me want to kick a baby. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Jay mean. Lethal is like handing you gold. You know what I mean? Now Cesaro they put out there. I mean, Brian Daniels has been doing well. And Punk's been doing well. You know why? Because they're like, do whatever you want. We will let you yeah. do it. Yeah. This is the Hardcore Nightmare, the original Beast of New England. I'm here to tell you, follow my boy on Chop Videos. Hit the like button. You can find me on at Bull Dread on Instagram or Michelangelo Kalo, a.k.a. the original Beast of New England on Facebook or at Bull Dread on Twitter. Woo! This is a Puerto Rican Punisher Vega telling you to check out Chop's videos on YouTube. He's got the best collection of classics in New England wrestling and professional wrestling in general. So go ahead, subscribe, give him a follow, give him a like and hit the bell notification so that you get the latest videos when they drop. Y no te olvide, que guste o no te guste, chop videos, esa es la que hay.
this is the man they call Vega. Vega, relax, listen on. Tell them my career as a professional wrestler. And remember, subscribe to the top video. I need you hit the bell notification so that you don't miss other interviews. Y guste o no te guste, esta es la que es.